Good morning, everybody. I'd like to everyone to the start of the 21st meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee in 2018. Can we please ensure all electronic devices are uh, on silent mode? We've received apologies from Gail Ross. Uh, we wish her a speedy recovery. And we're joined instead this morning by Lin Linda Fabiani, who's her substitute on the committee. Can I also take this opportunity to thank our outgoing convener, Christina McKelvey. Christina has served the Equalities and Human Rights Committee uh, with commitment and uh, dignity, and uh, we wish her very well in her new post as Minister. Um, our first item of business today is our first oral evidence session on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. And we have two panels of witnesses giving evidence to us this morning. Uh, in the first panel, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr Susan McVie, who is Chair of the Quantitative Criminology at the School of Law in Edinburgh University. Uh, Dr Claire McDermott, who is the Deputy Head of School of Law at the University of Strathclyde. And Malcolm Schaffer, who is Head of Practice and Policy at the Scotland Scotland's Children's Reporter Administration. Welcome to you all. I'd like to start by asking the panel, um, who obviously uh, have, have varying interests in the bill and the progress and the journey that we've been on to get to this point, um, what is your view of the bill and um, do you think it answers the, the requirements that were set out in the Statement of Intent by the Government? Let me start. Please. We welcome the bill. Um, we don't necessarily see it as an end to the debate, um, but we believe it sends out a strong message in terms of the ability to tackle difficult behaviour by children without criminalising them. Um, we see this as being an important and logical next step following the um, Parliament's earlier decision to raise the age of criminal prosecution. But we also think that there's further work that could be done in terms of looking at an even higher age. And we hope that the government might um, commit to further work looking at um, raising the bar further to the age of 16. I think there are separate complications in that, but I believe that that should be properly looked at. Thank you, Malcolm. Dr McDermott. Um, yes, I personally greatly welcome the bill. Um, I think a uh, rise in the age of criminal responsibility is long overdue. Um, I think there are advantages to raising it to 12. Um, it accords with the way the civil law gives capacity to children in some areas. You can make a will, for example, when you're 12. Um, it accords with the transition that they make physically from primary to secondary. Um, and it meets just the international requirements set by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child that 12 is the bare minimum. Um, like Malcolm, I think there are questions about raising it higher still. Um, much of that in recent years has come from emerging neuroscience, which suggests or gives evidence, in fact, for the fact that young people's brains develop such that their impulse control is not fully developed until they're in their early 20s. We've had developmental psychology for a long time, suggesting that development is at different rates than different children, but the necessary intellectual development might not come through till the mid-teens. Um, and other international obligations under the Beijing rules suggest that we should try to have the ages which confer some forms of adulthood clustered together. 12 is still quite a lot younger than, for example, the age at which you can marry, and perhaps more importantly, the age at which you can sit on a jury, which is 18. Um, further possible option might be to raise the age to 12 and then look at having a criminal defence for children over that age who still lack the capacity to be found criminally responsible. Thank you. And finally, Dr Movey. Um, yes, I would agree with my two colleagues that uh, the, the bill is long overdue um, and that raising the age of criminal responsibility to 12 um, is a good first step. Um, whether it represents a progressive commitment to international human rights standards, um, I would question. Um, I think there are a number of reasons why we should be with urgency looking at increasing it even higher. We know that the UN Convention states that age 12 is the bare minimum. Um, it still leaves Scotland trailing behind the vast majority of Europe and many other countries, both developed and developing, in terms of our age of criminal responsibility. 
And in terms of whether it will actually have any impact on children in Scotland, I think the evidence is fairly slim. Um, the Criminal Justice uh, Licensing Act 2010 already placed a, a presumption of no prosecution for under 12, so therefore that's already in place. De facto, we're already using a minimum age of criminal responsibility of 12. We know, looking at the evidence from Malcolm's office, that uh, very few children under the age of 12 are actually referred on offence grounds, and certainly very, very few are referred on very serious offending. Um, we know that um, retaining uh, an age of criminal responsibility at 12 means that children who are still at a very vulnerable age, certainly in their kind of mid-teenage years, um, going th uh, go through a system which um, is not does not always have a positive outcome. Um, for example, we know that those who end up in our criminal justice system disproportionately come from poorer backgrounds and a huge proportion of them come from either looked after backgrounds or um, youth justice backgrounds. So uh, I think we, we have a way to go in terms of um, having a progressive commitment to those international human rights standards that would put our children at the heart of a, a, a welfare system um, that would not damage them. Thank you very much, all of you. I'm now going to move to questions from colleagues, and I'd like to bring in Oliver Mundell to begin. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, I wondered if I could start by just going back a step and asking you uh, why uh, the eight current age was set at eight, if you could speak on that, um, and also why it's taken so long uh, to, to, to look at changing it. Um, in the midst of history of Scots criminal law, it was set at seven. Um, the institutional writers have a very developed system for deciding whether children could have criminal responsibility, but nobody in Scottish legal history has ever wanted anybody aged six or under to be criminally responsible. It was raised to eight in 1932, seem seemingly because there was a view that it should be raised, so it went up one year. Um, my opinion on why it's taken so long to go any further is that there perhaps has been a tendency to say Scotland has the children's hearing system, so we're dealing with children on a welfare basis, so we don't need to worry about it. But of course, for some time up until the 2010 Act, children aged eight could be prosecuted in cases of very serious offences. So um, I would agree that it has taken a long time. Yes, I, I'd go along with Claire. I think actually the hearing system has been uh, 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 almost getting in the way of looking at the proper reform and lulling us into complacency and not recognising the sort of criminalisation effects that an appearance at a hearing for committing an offence can have, particularly in terms of disclosure. Um, so I think, again, for that purpose, this reform is desperately needed. And this I know we're talking, Susan's right, we're talking about a very small amount of children. I think we had about 200 8 to 11 year olds referred to the reporter for committing an offence last year. So a comparatively small number, and of those, very few appeared at a children's hearing. But still, the, the um, consequence is significant for those that do. Dr. McVie, do you have a view on this particular question? I, I have no knowledge of how it started, but I know that over the years it has been discussed and debated. And I think one of the reasons that, that nothing has happened until now is there's been no appetite um, within the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to, to increase it, um, partly for the reasons that my colleagues have already set out. Um, this committee has, sorry, Oliver, before I bring you back in, just we've heard in briefings over the summer and in, in, in other evidence sessions in, unrelated to this that um, one of the reasons, the catalysts for making this change of equalising both the age of criminal prosecution and the age of criminal responsibility is that without that equalisation, you still have the capacity, as you said, Malcolm, to get a criminal record that can impact on your disclosure. Do we have any metrics as to how many adults are currently affected by criminal records that were obtained before they were 12? I think probably the honest answer to that is no, but actually there may be quite significant numbers yeah. in terms of, you know, going back in history in particular, um, the system has evolved positively so that the number of children who are referred to the reporter for offending has dropped. 
particularly with the advent of the whole systems approach. Um, but if I go back, I mean, I started as a reporter in 1974, and you saw vastly more children being appearing at hearings for, commit, for having committed offences, and it was 1974 that the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act came in, um, and were appearing for offences that would not, did not be even referred to the reporter today, but would subsequently be made on supervision, and because of some of the rules around disclosure, that record lasts for a significant period of time, 40 years in many cases. Sorry, Oliver, do you want to come back? Yes, uh, can I also ask, I mean, obviously the prosecution age has gone up to, to 12 in, in the recent past. Why do you think that change was made, but this wasn't sort of changed at, at that point? I had an explanation for that. It um, seemed sensible that the age of criminal responsibility would go up. I think what it has allowed for, however, is a period when we've been able to see what would be the effect of a wholesale rise. Um, and as we know from the research done by the Children's Reporter Administration, we're not referring very many children aged 8, 9, 10 or 11 on offence grounds. I think there may be one other positive factor, and that's the 2011 Act, the Children's Hearing Scotland Act, which introduced new grounds of referral, um, which gives us more ability to cover cases where children are showing difficult behaviour, do need compulsory intervention, but you don't want to use the offence ground. I think there are now more alternatives, particularly the one about um, impact of behaviour on self or others. I think that the introduction of the um, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> the introduction of the getting it right for every child policies and the whole systems approach has actually reshaped the way that practitioners um, are working with young people and how they think about the, the potential effects of putting them into a system where it can be damaging. So I, I suspect that some of the change in, in referrals to the children's reporter is that children are being seen more as children in need of help and support rather than children as offenders. So there may have been some practitioner change um, around that. But we also know that there's been a widespread change in the way that children are behaving. Um, and that's not just in Scotland. We can see it right across the UK and in many other international countries as well. The number of young people who come to the attention of criminal justice agencies has been diminishing across many countries um, as part of a wider phenomenon called the crime drop um, and the crime drop across Europe and the, the US and many other countries is predominantly a crime drop amongst young people. Now whether what the, the reasons for that are complex but um, may be um, related in part to the change in the way that children spend their leisure time which is far more um, online and far less on street. Um, however the, 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 the a result of that is that um, a much smaller number of children are coming to the attention of the police and, as a result, the children's hearing system. Um, but also we, we know that the whole systems approach diverts children in a range of ways, which is very effective. Um, so therefore they're not requiring to come, to come in for more intensive intervention. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, of course. You. Yeah. Um, I know that you've, you've sort of all stated that you, you don't think this goes far enough and obviously you've referenced already the, the, the previous sort of rise of a year. Um, do you think that there's a potential danger that if this bill uh, passes as, uh, uh, as proposed, uh, that this will be seen as the end of the debate around the age of criminal responsibility for another generation? <laughs> I can only say, uh, and I hope that there would be further thinking. I think we can do work with an SCRA as we did with eight to 11 year olds in looking at um, comparing why children are being referred for offence grounds in say the age group 12 to 16, looking at the issues to see and to suspect find out that the similar background issues that we'd identify, but also that allows time to tease out what are the implications for the old age group um, of how it would be tackled if, say, you had a 15-year-old charged with a particularly significant and serious offence. Um, you know, how would that be dealt with in the legal system if there was no age of criminal responsibility? Now, I believe there are ways of doing that, and certainly my fundamental belief is I hope that there will be further reform. But I think that 
those are issues are, if you like, separate and more complex than the eight to eleven year olds and need some teasing out. That, that it would be kept under review. I think if you look at it at all, your first question is yours. How did it remain a tape for so long? And there isn't. There are answers, as you've heard, but perhaps not particularly effective answers. Um, and having come this far and having a bill to raise it to 12, it's clearly on the agenda, and I would hope that it would stay there. Um, I, I would agree. I think if... And I come back to the words of the bill itself um, to reflect a progressive commitment to international <clears throat> human rights standards. And I think if Scotland is a country that looks to its comparators to see what's happening elsewhere, to, to reap the best of what's happening in other <coughs> countries. And if you look um, not just at Europe, but internationally, the direction of travel for the age of criminal responsibility is upwards. Um, so where it is being changed, it's certainly not coming down. Um, there's a really great example in Denmark of um, a, a natural experiment, if you like, <clears throat> where um, following a particularly punitive period where um, the, there was a tough on uh, crime uh, policy agenda, the Danish government decided to reduce its age of criminal responsibility from 15 to 14. Um, researchers were then able to test the effect of that legislative change on the 14-year-olds who um, experienced the change and were subject to um, uh, criminal, um, uh, criminal justice policy as opposed to the prior 14-year-olds who had escaped that attention. And what they found was that following the change, um, the rates of offending amongst 14-year-olds went up significantly. Um, and they were still more likely to be offending 12 to 18 months later. They were also more likely to drop out of school at an early stage, and those who did stay in school achieved uh, far less in terms of their educational attainment. Um, that policy was changed back up to 15 within two years. So I think there, you know, if we want to look at evidence in other countries, um, the vast majority of European countries have 14 or 15 as their minimum age of criminal responsibility. Scotland, even, Scotland is currently at the bottom of the pile. Moving it up to 12 puts it slightly higher up, but still at the bottom of the pile, um, next to other countries who are already considering moving the age up. For example, the Netherlands, um, that has an age of criminal responsibility currently of 12, but they're looking to 14 at the moment. So, so I, I hope this would very much stay on the agenda because it's what's on the agenda of many other countries. That's, that's fascinating. I, I think Fulton McGregor would like to come in. So much a, a supplementary. Um, convener through yourself, I just wonder whether um, Dr McVie would be able to make that um, study available to the, to the, of course. Uh, to the yes. committee. Yep. Thanks very much. Yeah, that would be great, Susan, if you can liaise with Clarks about it. There's a paper that I can submit afterwards. Excellent. But, um, Here's one we prepared I'll, earlier. I'll append that paper. <laughs> we like that. Fantastic. Like um, that. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, Convener. I wanted to follow on from the, the, the line of questioning that um, Oliver Mundell um, has been raising, because I'm really interested in why the decision has been taken to raise it to 12. And I know you touched on it in your earlier answers, but I'm, I'm really keen if you could perhaps expand a bit on, on where we sit with the rest of, of, of Europe. I mean, I know there are only three, un three other countries that have an age of 12, so we will still be very much on the floor because 12 is the minimum that the UNCR has said it should, it should be raised to. Um, but I'd also be keen on your views on how raising the age to 12 sits with the government's agenda around GERFEC and the really good work that's been done around getting it right for every child, and do they all fit together? So perhaps you could expand on, on your views on 12. Uh, um, 12, I think, as has been said earlier, was the easy one in terms of it fits with the age of prosecution. Um, the evidence of offending referrals in that age group is much smaller. So, bluntly, it's, it's an easy one to crack um, for in terms of the legislative impact. Um, as you go higher, well, where do you stop the bar? Do you stop it just at 14, or do you go on to 16? Or even some would say 18. Um, each of those throws in more questions, questions which I believe can be answered, um, 
but need careful thought to ensure that we have a system that can still respond to the difficult behaviour of a child, no matter what that age, and offer proportionate um, measures that don't criminalise somebody for all life, which is one of the big issues around the use of offending, even within the hearing system, um, which allow rehabilitation, allow that getting it right for a child, and that's where it absolutely fits with the GERFEC agenda of working with a child in their best interests, taking account of their well-being, um, but ensuring that the work that is done there does not have an impact, an adverse impact on that child for the rest of their life. Perhaps we could come on to talk about behaviour and understanding in, in, in a minute, but I don't know if the rest of the panel have any, any further views on raising it to 12. I think it's, it's hard to think of reasons why you wouldn't raise it to 12. So I agree with Malcolm that um, if you're going to raise it, it makes sense to go there. And we have the evidence base from the Children's Report Administration that, in fact, it may not make that much difference to raise it to 12. Children can still be referred on the ground of causing harm to themselves or others, which has come in from 2011. Um, I think the issue of what goes with criminal responsibility as opposed to just responsibility, because children's hearings have the ability to discuss with a child, whatever age we're, that, that child is referred to them, responsibility for any behaviour, whether it's chunting from school or, or any of the other conduct grounds on which they've been referred, and to help them to take responsibility for that behaviour and move on from it. Criminal responsibility has, particularly at the moment, the issue of disclosure attached to it, but there will always be a particular stigma attached to um, having committed a criminal offence, whichever forum deals with it. Um, and if there is a way to raise the age and diminish that stigma attaching to young people, I think that that would be very helpful. Yeah, um, yes, I'm going to come back to the progressive commitment to international human rights standards yet again. The UN Convention states that a child is anyone under the age of 18, <laughs> um, and it stipulates also that we should act in the best interests of the child. And within other areas of Scottish policy, I think we have been showing a very strong commitment to human rights. So policing, for example, um, the changes in policing, for example, even the changes in stop and search most recently, shows a very strong commitment to human rights. And there's a, a very well-crafted section in the stop and search code of practice um, around how children and young people and vulnerable people should be dealt with in terms of stopping and searching. GERFEC and the whole systems approach are very very much founded on human rights principles and through those policies what we've been trying to do is um, divert more young people away from formal interventions into um, more effective but less intrusive forms of intervention in terms of their behaviour. We're trying to retain more 16 and 17 year olds within our youth justice system. All of that fits with an international standard of human rights. So for me, the, 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 the decision to set the age of criminal responsibility at 12 jars with all of those other things. Um, in terms of how we sit within Europe, we're 10 years behind Belgium, who have an age of criminal responsibility of 18. Um, we are well below most of our, um, we're certainly below our Nordic neighbours, um, who we consider to be similarly progressive to us. Um, they all have an age of criminal responsibility of 15. Um, we're much lower than many other Latin American, Asian, even African countries. Um, and I think that it's interesting that, that, that one of the things it says in the, the, the bill is that it's not so much taking account of capacity, and yet the age of criminal responsibility is entirely about capacity, and we should be taking that into account. As Claire's already said, there is a, a, a growing body of neurological evidence that shows that brain formation does not end in the teenage years. Um, that actually the, the frontal cortex, which is the area of the brain that controls um, behaviour, um, really doesn't uh, become fully formed until the mid-20s. There's a growing sociological literature that says that adolescence as a, as a period of development is ageing. Um, 
people are uh, leaving home later, they are getting married later, they are having children <coughs> later, they are entering the, the labour market later than ever before. So we see this sociological shift, we've got increasing information about neurological development, and there's a broad criminological literature that's saying that children are not starting to offend until they're older. So I think the, the evidence around shifting the age upwards is compelling. And if this is a start, moving it to 12 is the start of a journey um, and, and the, the age will, will be moved, do you think it would be helpful within the legislation to have a review clause to say after two years we, we re revisit this and if appropriate we raise it by two years for example or a year? I personally would very much support that, yes. Then you have a formal requirement to have it under review. I think that would be very helpful also. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think that would also give government a mandate to put in place. Um, uh, I know that they have an advisory group that has been very active in, in providing evidence for this particular bill, but it would give that group a mandate to continue to look at the, the wider evidence in order to have a kind of more informed decision about what the correct age would be. And are you aware in countries where the age is higher, what approaches they take to young people? Do they have similar welfare-based <coughs> approaches and interventions as, as we do? It varies hugely. Um, <laughs> and um, th there's no one-size-fits-all um, youth justice system. Some countries, and there's no other country that's adopted a children's hearing system, and I think it's still considered to be unique and is the envy of, of many countries. Um, there are other countries that have a similar so sort of welfareist structure, but most other countries do have some form of youth courts, which of course we've managed to avoid for the most part. Um, so I think it is worth saying though, I mean we've, all, we've talked about the age of criminal responsibility in other countries, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because um, although some countries have a minimum age of criminal responsibility, they may have other wider policies that shape the way in which young people are dealt with. So Russia, for example, the age of criminal responsibility is 16, but they have a, a kind of get-out clause that says that children who commit severe or grave offences can be prosecuted as young as 14. So there's a, there's a, a lot of... Um, it's, um, different nuances in the way in which other justice systems operate that sometimes get around that problem. Mm -hmm. um, Oliver Mandel would like a brief supplementary on this point. Sorry, I just was uh, exactly on this point because it, it suddenly come to me um, just whether it was common to have a different age of uh, prosecution from criminal responsibility. Is that something you see elsewhere as well or are they, are they aligned in these other countries? Um, most, uh, most countries have an age of criminal responsibility and then they quite often have a graded set of ages for other things. Sometimes those graded ages are upwards, so they'll have a, an age of criminal responsibility at 15, for example, but they won't prosecute beyond 15 or uh, 16 or 17. Some other countries go the other way, so they have a minimum age of criminal responsibility, but an effective age of criminal responsibility that's younger than that. Um, so, so that there, there are, as I say, there are many nuances around how justice systems operate, which would mean that a period of further review would be very useful. Thank you, Oliver. Mary, you had one more question. I think. Well, I've got two more questions. Well, two more questions. Okay. Apologies. Um, are you aware of any studies that have been done in, in any European countries of um, how high the age of criminal responsibility is and the level of adult offending? Is, is it the case where it's a, a higher age of minimum c criminal responsibility, there is a lower rate of adult offending? Any views on that? I, I'm thinking about the, uh, I, I, the... The short answer is I haven't seen any such studies. Um, however, mm. I would say that those countries, for example, our Nordic comparators, have lower rates of criminal conviction than we do here. And I think the evidence around the impact of criminal justice contact in the early teenage years and its longer term impact in terms of a, a longer term criminal conviction career are compelling. And that there is strong international evidence to show that the earlier and the, the more intense your um, systemic contact is 
Um, and actually, we, we did a comparison with Germany, which has more of a punitive system, and Scotland, which has much more of a welfarist system. And we find very similar things, that those children who had an earlier contact and more intensive contact are far more likely to end up in the criminal justice system and to have a longer-term criminal <coughs> career um, than those who were not drawn into that system, even when those young other young people were offending. To similar extents. Now, that's not to say. I think we've got to be careful. I mean, we, we, there are practitioners do not go into youth justice services every day, um, thinking that they're causing damage to young people. And actually, many young people come out of youth justice services, um, and they have turned their lives around um, significantly. But so, so we look at the average effect over time, and the average average effect does still suggest that, um, on balance the negative consequences of early and intensive um, contact, which essentially recycles young people round justice um, system for a long time and then throws them out into the adult criminal justice system, is hugely damaging. Those labels that are attached to young people, um, they, they never come off. I was talking to someone at a Scottish prison service event yesterday who was talking about the fact that he had to move 300 miles away from his home, from his family, um, in order to, to lose that label and restart his life. We shouldn't have to make young people leave their homes and their communities in order to shift a label that is applied by a system. Thank you. Great. Okay. Any, any, any other views? No? Yep. Can, can I move on then to, to um, ask you about behaviour and, and understanding? <laughs> and young people um, that are aware of the difference between right and wrong, but are unable to understand the full consequences of their actions. And if you use that as an argument for raising the age of criminal responsibility, how, at, at what point do you, you raise it to? At what point do you stop? At what point do you say every young person fully understands the consequences of their actions? And is there enough... Sorry, this is a long question. Is there enough flexibility within the system to say that, for example, a young person of, of, of 13 um, that, that may commit a crime or a young person of 12 that commits a crime um, understands the difference, slightly understands the consequences, but, but doesn't really fully understand the consequences? And someone of, of 15 doing it because the um, the development of young people is, is completely different. You could pick a room of, of 20 young people and they have all developed differently. So how do you get that medium that fits for everyone? You've hit the nail on the head of using chronological age for any mm -hmm. purpose. That It draws a beautiful, clear line that law likes very much, but it doesn't tell you much about the person that it's related to. There are possible ways of dealing with that um, by having an age of criminal responsibility and um, then looking at individual young people in England and Wales for, for a thousand years, in fact, until 1994. They had the Dolly Incapax presumption, which presumed that children aged between 10 and 14 didn't have that understanding, and the prosecution had to prove effectively that they did. Um, some academic commentators have suggested, instead of that, that you might have a test of criminal responsibility. You could do that at a pre-trial stage to test the child's capacities in the areas in which you, you need them, which are broader than just simply knowing the difference between right and wrong. Toddlers understand that simply because they're told not to do something, but um, they don't have the kind of internalisation of the rules. Um, or another possibility, which I'd suggested in my opening remarks, might be to have a defence of developmental immaturity, that those young people who simply, it would be unfair to hold them criminally responsible, <coughs> could plead. So um, the age will draw an arbitrary line, um, and it is difficult to know where where that should be, but, but those are other possibilities around the edges of that. Okay, Anybody else thank you. So I'll move to... Uh... I, I, I would just say that if you look at the neurological literature, then it would say that full brain maturity doesn't occur till around age 25. Now, I can't see there being any appetite to set the age of criminal responsibility <laughs> there, um, but as Claire says, having an arbitrary... If, if we decide to use a legal threshold in an arbitrary age, then we have to have other 
policies and um, allowances uh, in place to take account that we are all different and that there are many adults that you could question whether they have the capacity to fully understand. And very few people have the capacity to fully understand what the impact of criminal justice system contact will be on their later lives. Certainly this Parliament has grappled with the issue of age of majority on a range of legislation. In some legislation you have two ages of majority as well, I think, in terms of vulnerable adults and uh, protection of vulnerable groups. Um, Fulton McGregor. Uh, convener, I'm wondering if, if Malcolm Chaffer would be um, kind enough to, to explain what happens in the process when a child uh, or a young person of any age, not necessarily under 12, uh, is referred on offence grounds. If you can take us through that process, because I think it would be quite helpful for the committee to have that on the record while you're here in this capacity? Sure. Um, if a child is referred to the reporter by the police for committing an offence, then we've got to look at two different issues. Firstly, have we got enough evidence to prove that the child has committed the offence? And also, if we have or haven't, is there an alternative ground that might be more appropriate? And secondly, is this a child who's in need of compulsory measures of supervision? Because it's only the children who are in need of compulsion that should be referred to a children's hearing. To help with that decision, the reporter would try to gather together such information as is proportionate and necessary for um, a conclusion. So make contact with those agencies who might know the child, school obviously, um, social work department perhaps, perhaps medical authorities depending on the individual situation, to try to draw together a whole picture of that child, to look at that child's behaviour, to look at the reasons behind that behaviour, and it may be, and certainly there was evidence of a number in the study we did of 8 to 11, that when you look at the child, what's going on with the child, you see that there are other more significant issues that are the cause of that behaviour, which might relate to parental care at home, parental control, um, or even particular associations the child's got. And the reporter might think, well, you know, the whole purpose of our decision making should be about identifying the ground that signifies the problem in the child's life. So we might decide, even though the child had been referred for an offence, that actually we would not proceed with that offence. We would proceed with grounds of lack of parental care because this child's not getting appropriate supervision. If the second test is made of um, the need for compulsion. So again, we'd be looking um, to the social work department, school, other agencies, is the issue that the child's presented an ongoing problem? Is it a one-off? To what extent can it be dealt with in the family? To what extent are other agencies there who can support the family on a voluntary basis without having to involve compulsion? Um, so only those children who have a, enough evidence to demonstrate the need for a grant of referral, and B, um, our need of compulsion should end up at a children's hearing. So overall, we refer, on last year's figures, about 25% of children that are referred to us to a hearing. And interestingly, when it comes to children who commit an offence, that figure drops to about 8, 10%. And that may be partially because we use other grounds, but partially because we think that there's other measures that can be involved without the need for compulsion or involvement in the system. So that's the process of the reporter's decision making. Clearly, if it goes, the reporter refers the child to a hearing, then um, the child and parents would appear and be asked if they accept the grounds of referral or not and any denial or lack of understanding would be referred to the sheriff court to determine if the grounds are made out. And if they are made out, it comes back to another children's hearing for disposal, and the hearing has the job of deciding the need for compulsion in that case. So 
So the, the, the last bit there of your, um, of your explanation, which, which I think was, it was very good, was actually where I wanted to get to. And I should say, I should have uh, declared an interest earlier as a registered social worker, um, and I worked in child protection for, for eight years. So I, I wanted to actually explore that a wee bit more, a child of any age, when they actually go to a children's hearing and those grounds are put to them. Um, can you expand on that a wee bit and um, tell the, the, the committee how that actually works and what rights the child has in that process and their family? Um, we would flag with the child the ability to get um, legal representation in certain circumstances, um, particularly if there was any issue of um, secure authorisation. Um, we, or if the child was coming from custody, we would send out with the grounds a leaflet flagging that acceptance of grounds may have an impact on future employment prospects. You may wish to speak to a solicitor prior to that. Um, by no means all families do um, get legal representation. Um, at the hearing itself, the chair is under the duty to satisfy him or herself that um, there's a proper understanding of the grounds and that because it's such an important part in terms of it's the threshold to the hearing system um, and to compulsory measures that they should not be proceeding further unless they are satisfied of acceptance and understanding both by child and parents. Yeah, I mean, it always struck me when I was working in a, a particular area that, um, and I don't know if it's the if, if it's the case across across the country, but perhaps I can ask you your experience on this of whether, um, when a child and their family are put in that position, which is already a quite stressful situation, that it, the the desire to get get it over with, if you like, um, is greater than any understanding that might be around about possible impact on future employment or life chances 10, 15 years or less later. For a number of reasons, I really worry about our current disclosure provisions and the extent to which not only are they not understood by children or parents, I'm not sure they're understood by all professionals because they are so complicated. Okay, I, I'm, I'm happy to leave that, that line of question there. I was going to go into a bit about the, um, what reports would bring out about um, other circumstances for children, but I think you, you covered that in your uh, initial response, so thanks very much. I think before I bring Linda in, Mary's got a short supplementary on Fulton's yeah. line of question there. Yeah, can I just ask you if you could perhaps expand on the, the measures that you are able to take when a child comes before <clears throat> a hearing? Is there enough flexibility in, in the system that if a child appears before you um, and, and you need to take some action um, to, to help that child, because ultimately that's what you're doing, you're helping young people that come, can you tweak the system to use a bit of this and a bit of that, or is it quite <laughs> rigid? And how often are the, the measures that you are allowed to use, how often are they reviewed and either added to or changed? You can apply any measure on a child within what's proportionate and what's legal. Um, that, that can and should first look at what is available to support the child within home, but also can involve residential measures if necessary um, the issue of the availability of services is, is a good question, which can be partially a geographical accident and partially may be an issue that's at risk in terms of current public spending impacts um, on um, the wealth of, say, youth offending supports and skills that is available in each area, um, which at one point was quite significant, but there seems to be a diminution of that. Now, in terms of review, I think that's probably one of the stronger points of the hearing system, insofar as no child can be on supervision for longer than a year without having to come back for further hearing, that child or parents can ask for a review at any point after three months that a social worker can bring it back at any stage, either because it's working and is no longer needed, 
or because it's no longer working and something else needs to be tried. And in the extreme cases where a child's behaviour is so significant that a child's placed in secure accommodation, then that must be reviewed in a maximum of three months by a further children's hearing. That's very helpful. Thank you. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, can I say at the start that uh, as a substitute in this committee, I'm not as immersed in it as my, my colleagues are, uh, but I've jotted down a few things that, that I've heard that I, I would like a bit of information on. Uh, the first thing I'd like to ask is, when I read the papers, it spoke about the current system, where if um, someone's between 12 and 16, the Lord Advocate can decide to move to criminal charge or criminal proceedings. And I just wondered how that might alter if we were to make the age of criminal responsibility 16. I understand that from 12 to 16, it's been a sort of uh, informal, non-official thing from what you said earlier. It's become practice rather than, than law. If, if it's 16, then the Lord Advocate would have no role because the child could not be charged with a criminal offence. Yeah, so I, I think what was puzzling me there is what about if it was a really serious issue that perhaps a 15-year-old... Um, I hesitate to use the word crime because if there's no criminal responsibility, but if, if something very, very serious happened that was deemed to be the fault, responsibility, whatever, of the 15-year-old, how would that be dealt with if the age of criminal responsibility was 16? That's when the decision about what age is set has to be based not just on kind of broad human rights standards, but on the issue of capacity, which I appreciate that the, the bill has not taken so much account of. But if we as a society agree that children under the age of 16 do not have the capacity to understand when they commit something that's very serious, then we have to stand by those young people and we have to put in place every measure that would support that young person from committing a crime again. And we have to put in place all measures possible to support the victim. But if we're taking an ideological stance that the age of criminal responsibility is 16, then <coughs> if a child younger than that age commits a crime, um, then we, would, would, we can't bend the rules. Now, when I say that, the, there are some countries that do put in place um, caveats to the age of criminal responsibility. I think that's a dangerous precedent to set because if you're going to put in place caveats, why bother having uh, a set age? Um, but the, if the principle is that we want to protect and support our young people, we have to accept that sometimes they will do bad things, um, even though that's um, relatively rare. Um, Talking about the issue of relatively rare, I think... Malcolm, you were able to talk about the number of 8 to 11 year olds, um, but I think you said that there was uh, more work, not enough work done so far in relation to 12 to 16, 15 year olds. I think if you were setting a review date in two years, one of the things we would offer to the Scottish Government, and indeed already have, is to do a similar study for 12 to 16 year olds as we did for 8 to 11 year olds to tease out. Um, particularly um, the nature of the offending that is being reported in that age group, how that would be covered um, if there was the bar was set at 16, um, what alternative measures would be available um, and what the implications are of that reform. That, and that ties in with, I think, what all, all of you have said and I recognise is that this would have to sit amongst wider policies um, that you you couldn't just unilaterally change that. There would have to be wider policies there, whether it's support, whether it's issue of disclosure, which I, I was getting the view from you that disclosure was such an important part of this. So there may well be wider policies that could look at the issue of disclosure, tying in with raising any age. Um, and I wonder if... I mean, I, I'm, I'm always up for review clauses. I, I think that often we don't study the effect of legislation enough. But this strikes me as a very major issue with a lot of policy implications. So 
I, th I think I'm picking up that you all agree with this legislation going forward. Do you think two years would be enough to really do this justice, to use the word? Taking account of disclosure, for instance, there's already significant work started in terms of PVG review and the management of offenders bill. Um, the work that we can do within SCRA would be easily achievable within that time period. Um, we need to tease through then the implications for um, any potential gaps in powers. For instance, um, the maximum bar for the hearing system, which would be the alternative route for compulsory support, is 18. And even that period between 16 and 18 is only covered if the child's on supervision. So is there a case for looking at extending the powers of referral to the hearing system to cover children and young people who are not on supervision um, but in need of compulsion um, to at least 18 and to tease out some of the implications of that? And just to think and tease out what the implications for um, somebody who commits a very serious and significant offence at 15 years, 11 months, and um, if the powers in the hearing system only last to 18, what, and there's still a need after that, how is that support provided? Um, I'm sure there are answers to that, but I think that's the sort of example of what's needed to consider in greater detail. Yeah. Done. The Edinburgh study of youth transitions in crime, which is a longitudinal study, looked at a group of young people who were growing up in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and they followed those children up over a six-year period and collected significant information on their social work contact, their children's hearing contact, their criminal records, and uh, it showed that um, it showed a number of things. It showed, first of all. The vast majority of children were getting involved in some bad behaviour. It it's a normal aspect of, of adolescent uh, development. Um, and the vast majority of those don't ever have any need for any kind of formal services. And there are all sorts of informal social controls that operate within our communities that take care of many of those things. So the children that come into the, the system, into the children's hearing system or to the attention of the police, tend to be a kind of a smaller segment, the, the thin end of, of that wedge. They're also the poorer end of that wedge, it has to be said. Children from poor communities, um, disadvantaged backgrounds, are significantly more likely to come into our justice services. So we need to bear that in mind in terms of resources. We're not just talking about resources to deal with offending. We're often talking about resources that are needed to deal with a multitude of quite complex needs. Um, our research found that um, children who travelled through the, the children's hearing system um, during the kind of mid-teenage years, some of them went on to have quite a chronic pathway of into convictions and, and, and ended up in our criminal justice system, and others actually didn't. And when we looked at what the key factors were that d decided whether they went on to have this chronic pathway or not, uh, we found that it wasn't their serious offending that was behind it. It was a series of other things. It was um, continuous and increasing police contact, it was um, in increasing contact with the youth justice system, to which, um, which in, in terms of its principles, um, which are very much set on the Kilbrandon principles, are, are absolutely spot on in terms of welfareism and human rights. Um, but often it's the implementation of uh, decisions made by that hearing system, because the resources don't exist to put in place the, um, the services that those young people need. But there was also school exclusion is a key factor in determining these young people's lives and the more we can keep children in school. So it does cut across a range of policy areas and, and that kind of integrated multi-agency response I think is something that Scotland has become very expert in. The whole systems approach is predicated on a, whole, on a, a multi agency response. So in I, I, do we want to have a longer than two year period? I would say let's stick with two years and see where we can get to in that time period. Otherwise, 
If you make it longer than that, there's a danger these things get kicked into the long grass. Um, but it gives you an opportunity to not just interrogate you know, the impact that it would have within youth justice, but also in terms of education, health, and all of the other areas that actually are the systems that need to be put in place in a rounded way to help the children that, that come to our attention. Um, thank you very, very much for that. Uh, can I just say, convener, that um, I, I understand everything that's being said here, and I understand the human rights implications, but I do have concerns at unilaterally saying, right, in two years, to, we'll have a review in two years' time, because two years in politics, particularly, let alone in life, is a very short time, and I feel that there is so much in there, and that you know, we should welcome the idea of making this initial change, but not be prescriptive about how long it should take to be able to review whether we should go further. Thank you. Um, just conscious we are coming perilously close towards the end of our time with you, I'd like to sort of finish up uh, by taking this back to children's rights. And I should have said at the start of the meeting that I refer my fellow members to my register of interest in that I was past convener of Together, which is the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Um, taking this back to children's rights, the, obviously this is in the context of the First Minister's announcement in the programme for government of the intention of the Scottish Government to bring uh, the principles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Child into in incorporation within Scots law. Um, and so thinking about that in the context, there are invariably tensions within the UNCRC, where rights can sometimes compete with one another. And I think to, the, there are tensions throughout various sections of this bill. Some are, are easy to rectify and some less so. But looking specifically at section 23, which is about place of safety, about the power of a police officer to remove a child from a situation and take them to a place of safety. There are immediately tensions within that. So, for example, the, the phrase in section 23.2 is that the constable may take the child to a place of safety and keep the child there if they are satisfied it's necessary to do so for a range of, of quite severe reasons. Obviously, that's an immediate tension between their protection rights and their participation rights. If they say, I don't want to be here, and the constable said tough, their, their Article 12 rights are impeded. Can, can the panel explore those tensions? <laughs> You've got three minutes. <laughs> they, cer they certainly exist, and I think that's one of the... the in, in the, the bill is extremely well thought through and much consideration has been given to minimising the sort of criminal justice aspect of it. But I think if you take away the link between the age of criminal responsibility and capacity, you're then saying children under 12 are not criminal because we said they weren't rather than because they don't understand what they're doing. And I think there's an issue in, in all of the other provisions about, well, how will that feel if you are a child? And we could now be taking a seven year old child um, under those place of safety provisions or, or um, the search provisions or indeed any of the other provisions. Um, and I think it's important to have an eye to that. I have to say, I read the bill thinking I wouldn't like any of these additional provisions at the end. And the, the, they are very well safeguarded, I think, in terms of the rights of the child to be protected. But it would be important not to lose sight of the tension. Um, I, I think expanding on that further, and I'll draw the, in our other panellists in a, a moment, but, but also in, in terms of the actual place of safety, the only place of safety that is referred to on the, um, the face of the bill is police stations. Now, albeit that's saying, as a last resort, you can use a police station, but obviously that and jars up against Article 37 rights about not being held along with adult suspects. Um, and I just wonder, do we need to do more to unpack that, A, perhaps to have a schedule of other places of safety constables should try first and if they have to be in a police station something on the face of the bill said never in cells and and with other safeguards around that drawing the other two panelists perhaps as well on this but perhaps dr majama do you clearly have a view i was just going to say i think that that would be helpful because if the legislation only gives one option even as the last resort there's a danger that that then becomes the first resort I think it is a tension. You're absolutely right. I mean, firstly, we hope these are powers that will be seldom, if ever, used. That's the first significant thing to say. Um, it, it is. I know a lot of thoughts been given to it. It and 
it's this balance of keeping the rights of that child within that process, um, but it does retain a lot of the elements of the criminal justice feel. Um, and in terms of alternatives to police station, well, I did see one respondent talk about if we're developing the barn house model in terms of child protection, um, is that not the sort of resource which could also be used for interviews of young children um, to get it away completely from the police station, get my brief um, um, back into the system and the feel of criminalization, which is the whole thing this reform is trying to get away from. So I'd hope it would be a measure that um, can be given some further thought in terms of imagination and use of alternative resources to make this reform properly meaningful. Yeah, I mean, if, if you've ever been in a situation where you have to remove a child in terms of a place of safety, it is a hugely distressing event. Um, and I think no one should be under any illusions that a child who's removed under those circumstances would be in severe distress. So taking them to a police station to me seems like one of the least humane things you could do, notwithstanding the fact that we have fewer and fewer police stations, of course. Um, so I think serious consideration should be given to, um, again, it comes down to a resource issue. Um, social work centres and family resource centres are also in short supply. But if we do want to take this seriously under a human rights standard, then we need to have humane places that we can take children to under those um, distressing circumstances. I would certainly agree, and I think that many of us would, would not consider that a police station on a Friday night would necessarily be a place of safety in any situation. Um, just a final question, because we, we do have to move on to the next panel, also on rights. And you mentioned uh, stop and search, which obviously this parliament has agonised over, and I think that we have moved some considerable distance from where we were, and I'm grateful for that. But are you content that the provisions under Section 25 about the power to search um, on suspicion of a crime about to be committed um, are sufficiently safeguarded by the work that underpins that? And should we happen on less enlightened times that the legislation we introduce in this Act or Bill um, will not allow a, a slide back into uh, just the, the wholesale searching of innocent children on our streets? On the contrary, I think the, the legislation as it's framed is pretty tight around the circumstances in which stop and search can take place. And I think police officers have um, have uh, have adapted very well to the, the introduction of the code of practice, which in addition to the legislation has given a fairly um, detailed set of circumstances around which it's expected that stop and search takes place. Um, there's a, the 12 month review of the stop and search processes ongoing at the moment uh, and recommendations will be made in that report, I think, for the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think some of those recommendations may be around slightly expanding the, um, the legislation again. I think there's some confusion, there's a grey area around the extent to which police officers can search in the circumstances of prevention of loss of life, um, which is slight, perhaps there, there's a slight uh, jarring within leg legislation that, that doesn't quite um, allow police officers the, the, the security of mind to know that they can search in those circumstances. Um, but I think otherwise, I think the, the current legislation is pretty tight. And we've seen from the reduction in the numbers of stops and searches and uh, in association with that, the increase, significant increase in detection rates that appears to be working well. Thank you very much. And can I thank you all for your time this morning? Um, certainly, if there's anything that you, you would like to have said that you didn't get the opportunity to, um, please do write back in. Um, we'll certainly be meeting with you privately, I'm sure, just in our consideration of this bill. But thank you very much for your time. I suspend the committee to change panels.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you very much. And now we move on to our second panel of witnesses today. I'd like to welcome Marion Gilhooley, who is Head of Strategy and Innovation at Includem, Claire Lightowler, who is Director of the Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice at the University of Strathclyde, Duncan Dunlop, Chief Executive at Who Cares Scotland, and Lindsay Hanvidge, who is Care Experience Policy Ambassador with Who Cares Scotland, and you are all very welcome. Just to say, um, you don't need to press the buttons to speak. If you do, terrible things happen, so the mic will be switched on for you. Um, so I'd really like to start in the same way I did with the first panel, is just to ask, go around the panel and ask their initial view of this draft bill, and if it meets, in their view, our, our stated intention to move uh, to a, uh, the UN sort of prescription of the minimum age of criminal responsibility. Lindsay, can I start with you? So I'm in agreement. I, I would like this movement to pass in Parliament, but I would also like the consideration of the age to be changed. I believe that right now, at the age of 12, yes, we have um, the age of criminal responsibility and where you can be convicted, um, but what are we doing moving it to 12? Where, where are we advancing in this? Um, yeah, I think that's my stance on that. That's really helpful. Thank you. Duncan. Hello, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I mean, I struggled to say this. This just looks like a wee bit of housekeeping we're doing. This isn't making this the best place in the world to grow up to be a child. This is just about getting us in the power in the worst place in Europe. And the last panel is saying Russia is the age of 14 and we might just get to 12. I really think this is shocking, to be honest. I mean, it's one of those, I think it's been a slight embarrassment. We've had it at the age of eight for so long. We just need to get this over the line of 12. But it's a time for our, I mean, our parliament to show some real leadership in this year, I think. Uh, we don't need to wait two years to review whether it's the right thing. We ought to go be far more bold with this. I mean, we speak very much for care experience population. We know uh, the consequence of that, and we'll talk more about it as the morning goes on, no doubt. But this should be at least 16, if not 18, because the consequences of uh, involvement with the justice system is more involvement in the justice system, which means more offences are being committed potentially later in life, and then you end up with a more likely to be involved, in, certainly as a young adult in the justice system. It doesn't create safer communities, and it doesn't do any good for those who are potentially the victims of crime or those young people who, um, who go through this entire system. We just have to look at it for the reality of what we know and not a populist mantra. Involvement of police, and actually, fact, bizarrely, and the justice system means people are more likely to continue offending. So we really have to look at this as a different approach. And I'd say seize the opportunity. Age of 12 is really nothing. Thank you. Marion. Um, I would say that we welcome the fact that we are debating a bill at this stage. Um, and I would agree that uh, the age of 12 is probably not, is not far enough. Um, it's uh, the absolute bare minimum, as suggested by the um, United Nations uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, so we would like to see it uh, go further. However, I think that it's fair to say that the provisions in the draft bill, or in the bill as introduced, um, cover some very complex issues. And I think that it's important to note that it's clear that um, a great deal of consideration has been given to those complex issues. Um, and, I, and I think that that does come across in the bill. Um, however, criminalising children is in nobody's interest. Um, and um, the stigma that's attached to um, that, that identity is incredibly damaging um, for those children um, and also for all of us, I think, um, in our society. Uh, I think that we need to be looking at the needs of children who display harmful behaviour. And I think that the term har harmful behaviour is much more helpful than thinking about offending and offending behaviour. And I think we need to look much more at how we use that kind of terminology. Thank you. And Claire? You're going to hear a very similar um, line of, of, of response. It's hard not to welcome this because, um, as we were discussing in the pre previous panel, it's been 20 years uh, um, since it was recommended in its a criminal way. So the life of the parliament, this has been ticking away in, in the background as something that I think most commentators, 96% of consultation respondents, everybody giving evidence um, that we've seen to your, your committee um, in written and oral forms um, to date, has indicated support for the, the, the age of 12. So 
you know, it, it's a moment, it's an important moment, it's an important statement on, on where Scotland stands in responding to children experiencing distress um, and behaving in ways that harm others. So it, it's, it is important to acknowledge that and, um, and, and to welcome that step. But as others have said, does it go far enough? Um, and what should that age be? And how can we better respond to that distress? And there's a lot of arguments around why, why it matters um, that, that we, we think about what's going on for children um, and the the truth is that a criminal response doesn't address the issues um, that children are experiencing we know that nearly all children that are involved in a pattern of offending behavior have backgrounds that involve domestic violence they're being harmed for um, by that by those around them themselves they're vulnerable they're victimized and it doesn't address those those issues so I suppose that's why this matters um, and, and it's why that that framing of a criminal lens can be really harmful because the child starts to think that they're bad others around the child thinks that they're bad and we don't get to the the real issues underpinning um, that thank you very much that's uh, very useful and it, we're starting to get unanimity across this panel which is quite a rare thing but a, a good one um i'd like to start with oliver mundell thank you uh convener can i just pick up uh, first of all on the point uh, duncan was making i mean from the first panel we've heard from today, I mean, they seem to suggest that it was much more complicated uh, to, to go beyond uh, the age of 12. Would, would you have us delay uh, the, this legislation to, to work through those issues, or do you think it's better to, to push ahead um, and, 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 and sort of start the process? Well, our aspiration is for it to be at least 16. It's a parliament's business about how quickly it can get there. Uh, it should be up to 18, really, uh, in terms of what we expect for, for young people and children, but we just know from the care experience perspective what will happen. The consequence, I'm not sure the consequence of delaying this to move it to a different age and look at all the consequences of it, potentially you could do it in parallel, but I don't think you need two years to review whether it's the right thing. It might be that it's going to take you two, three years to be able to implement it, because the consequences are beyond policing. It's in terms of how do we actually create different responses. This will come back to a cultural issue around how we view young people and the provisions that people were mentioning before that are available for vulnerable children uh, that are appropriate to meet their needs. So uh, we, we do need to be bolder with this. We really do. Uh, and it might be that this is something we're getting through in some of the provisions, uh, we can talk about them later, the, the good and the bad bits within them, potentially need, those need development. We. We really require to have the ambition for this to be up to at least 16 or 18. And if we don't do it now, it won't, it won't happen again. It's waited 20 years. It's not as though we've had a parliament that's been against this for 20 years. It just won't get on the legislative agenda. Well, it might do, but it's quite a risk. So I don't know that the technicalities of how you form the legislation, but we have to have the ambition, I think the recommendation from this, that we need to be going much further. Okay, uh, thank you for that. The, the other thing I wanted to um, ask about uh, that came up in the first panel was the idea of introducing a, a criminal defence uh, for children sort of over 12, but maybe below 16 or, or 18. Uh, do you think that that might satisfy some of your concerns in the meantime? And that's sort of to, to all the panel, I guess. To your first point first yep. and say that if passing this bill gets us to a place where we start to look beyond the age of 12 sooner, then that's what we should do, that's the right thing to do. Um, and it may be that that is the case. Um, in terms of looking at um, a defence, um, I think that that comes to a consideration of capacity. And I think that's a really complex issue. And I agree with the members of the previous panel around the, the problems that are introduced when we have a, a kind of flat line uh, cutoff point, but it's difficult to see how else you know, in law, we can have anything other than that. So my view is that every individual case where we're considering a child who has displayed harmful behaviour needs to be considered as an individual case and the needs of that individual child need to be considered in making decisions around what happens beyond that and what support is put in place for that child, but also for the victims of the impact of that harmful behaviour. So for me, it's very much around 
um, interpreting the law in a way that suits the needs of each individual. Claire, I understand that you touched on this in your written submission. Um, would you like to speak to that? Yes, I certainly would. I mean, the first um, thing, I suppose, is to think about um, if, if we're accepting new NCRC, then children are those under 18. So regardless of the, the minimum age chosen, then if it's not 18, there needs to be some thought about those children and how we're responding to children between that minimum age and the age of 18. Um, there are also obviously um, particular protections for care experiencing people up to 25 now and an acknowledgement of that older age range and the, and, the, and the need for protections for the older age group. So um, th this doesn't cut off at any particular age, you know. So I, I, I really welcome the um, um, about how far we can go as a minimum, and really teasing that out and testing that beyond the, the twelve. Um, but it, it's going to we're going to need to think about what do we do for those children, particularly under eighteen, um, in terms of a response. And yes, um, what we suggested was looking a little bit more closely at other jurisdictions that have more like the German model where you've got tests about children's ability to understand and act on that understanding and that's a really important bit um, you've heard this morning a, bit, a little bit about brain development another really important <coughs> factor is um, those around the child if a child is growing up in a criminal family in a criminal community if they're specifically being exploited um, and serious organized crimes groups do um, exploit vulnerable children do target them it's often that the, there is often a link between child sexual exploitation groups and serious and org organised crime. So a child can be being sexually exploited and then being used for a range of drug offences as well. Um, what are we doing when we're holding children that are in those circumstances um, criminally responsible? So it's the ability to act um, and, and operate free will and independence. If your family and if those around you are um, being criminal, encouraging your criminal activity, how can you say no as a child? Can you say no? Do you have that independence? So it's not just about understanding, um, but the ability to exercise that free will. And that's why I think some tests, um, putting in place some, can a, can a child understand and can a child act on the basis of that, that understanding could be a really useful addition um, to, to the bill and whatever minimum age is chosen, if it's to be less than 18. The, if we do know that they're care experienced and why they're care experienced uh, and maybe it would be worth bringing Lindsay at this point because I think it's really worth understanding that children aren't born bad, they're really not and what we do and, and how they grow up and nurture um, or how we parent them or how we bring them up as a society is we sometimes push them further away from being the best version of themselves uh, and at some stages maybe potentially they can't get back to being the best version of themselves but we already heard up to the age of 25, there's a good chance you can really make quite significant changes in your life. And I think if we're looking at the age of 12, and let's say this thing that Lindsay can give a, you know, an example from when she was at the age of 13 and when you, know, you first interacted with the, the, the justice system. The first night I went into care was um, May 2007. Um, it was Friday night and I remember I was away to babysit just along the street from where my mum lived. Um, and when I came home that night, there was loads of police outside my the flat that we lived in, and the social worker was there. Um, and when I went up the stairs, they told me that myself, my brother, and my sister were getting taken away from my mum. I remember um, feeling angry, feeling sad. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to leave my mum. Um, they tried to force me. The social workers tried to force me out the house and. That didn't go down too well. Um, you can imagine being 13, you're, you've got all these emotions building up and I kicked off a little bit and I, I told them I didn't want to leave my mum. My mum was going to be left herself. Um, and they took, they took my behaviour as harmful behaviour, as if I was just kicking off. So that's how it felt to me, that I was just kicking off for the sake of it. Um, and they, they put me in handcuffs in my mum's house in front of her, in front of my brother and my sister. I was 13, my sister was 6, my brother was 14, 15. Um, they took me out of the house, I wasn't even dressed properly. I remember, my mum will kill me for saying this, but I remember having um, jammies on that had a hole in the back of them. I, I didn't realise what ones I had put on, but they still 
had me cuffed um, at the front and forcibly removed me from my mum's house. Um, I, got, I got my first charge that night. Um, when I got to the bottom of the coast and they were being really pulling me about the place and I, I was quite a wee girl when I was 13 um, and I hit him but it, it was just I wanted him away, I wanted to get back up the stairs and make sure my mum was okay um, and I get took to the police station that night so this happened maybe about 10 or 11 o'clock at night um, I wasn't picked up until about half seven the next morning I was, back, I was taken to a children's home where my brother and my sister were. Um, they had spent their first night in a children's home. I spent my first night in here in a prison cell, um, locked up. <laughs> I hadn't done anything wrong, but I was felt, I felt like I had done something wrong. Um, and that, that was my first experience of um, being charged or being involved with the police. Um, and that was them um, taking me to a place of safety. It didn't work out that way for me. Can I thank you on behalf of the committee for the candour uh, of, of your statement there? I think I don't think anyone can fail to have been moved by that. So thank you for your bravery in sharing that. And we will carry it with us throughout the deliberations here. I'm very struck, I think, from that story and, and from what we've heard in the unanimity across the panel in terms that, that 12 is, is the floor, you know, it's the de minimis position set by the UNCRC. That when I hear your story and I hear the Scottish Government's view that they've picked 12 because it's a nice fit, because that's when people go to high school, I'd like them to meet you. I'd like them to hear your story and the reasons that, that you were, uh, well, accused of offending behaviour when you were doing what I think anybody in this room would have probably done in your circumstances. So thank you so much. I think, um, before I come back to Oliver to see if there's, have you got anything? Anything uh, else in, in particular, but I mean, I would uh, just quickly say, I mean, I, I think it's not just about uh, age. Uh, when you hear a story like that, it's also you know, about the way that the, the criminal justice system decides to, mm -hmm. to treat people um, and, and sometimes a, a, for a whole variety of reasons the way the system works that compassion doesn't always uh, come, come through and um, that's very frustrating and sad to hear. But it's dehumanised, you don't feel like you're valued, you don't feel like you are a human, you're just another wee person that's causing trouble and that, that's what they do is they, they put you away and um, you're left there and then when you come out so I remember the next morning at half seven, I, I got a bowl of lentil soup and bread for my breakfast, and nobody spoke about me being in the cells that night. Like, I was just expected to deal with it, and that was that. We went on, got on with our day. Um, but thank you for listening to my story. And, mm -hmm. Sharing it. Um, I'm really struck by the fact that we are, as a parliament, coming to terms with an understanding of trauma and um, and looking to all our working practices across public life and from a trauma-informed perspective. And what happened to you is the antithesis of that. It's the complete reverse of that. A, a, a trauma-informed approach to what you were going through being separated from your mum should never have been to add tr additional horrendous trauma to that by putting you in the prison cell overnight. Um, and, and I think that this comes back to what both Claire and Marion were saying about looking to why young people are exhibiting harmful behaviour, understanding what unresolved trauma, attachment disorder and loss can do in terms of behaviour and meeting that with a, a more appropriate response. Can I just ask what you think a more appropriate response in terms of a trauma-informed approach to dealing with harmful behaviour would look like? And um, when when we get this right across Scotland, this is what happens. You know, it, it's um, this is not linked to the age of criminal responsibility. When we see the child, we understand the context for their behaviour. Um, we challenge where appropriate why, why they're behaving in, 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 in particular ways, and we bring the professionals we need to around the child and, and what they need from across psychology, social work, um, but mainly those that have got a direct relationship with the child. Child, um, supported by, by by that team of professionals and support. So when we get this right, you know that 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 can happen and, and does happen. The issue about the criminal responsibility angle on it is that it encourages that sole responsibility for behaviour to be placed on a child and what they're externalising to be the focus. So it means we can miss what is going on and uh, everybody can miss um, at points because we're so focused on how how they're harming others and that's absolutely. Absolutely important.
important to keep that in mind, but to really understand that rather than just attaching a criminal responsibility label um, to, to allow us really to get under the surface and actually better, um, better spot that child, but also reduce the risk for others as well. And I think, when, as, as Claire says, when things work well, it's when professionals work well together, uh, always thinking about that child and what they need. Um, and pro se um, service providers like include them, uh, providing relationship-based support that allows workers to get to know that child and to find out what their experience has been and to listen and hear what that experience has been. Um, and then to start to help the child work through how that experience has influenced their behaviour and then think about the consequences of that behaviour and how to uh, develop different ways of, of coping. Um, but all the while acknowledging um, what has happened and, and understanding what has happened for that child, which is really important, helping the child understand what's happened. And crucially, um, removing the inference that there is some, that there is blame for their experience, um, and uh, that's something that we are passionate about. Can I just yeah. add to that? Actually, the, the other element of this is to keep the child included in various settings. Susan McVie alluded it, um, to, to this in terms of school inclusion, but also in terms of social activities, um, groups, youth groups, and to, to try as much as possible, wherever possible, um, to ensure that things are put in place to support the child to continue those things that are going to help them step away from problematic and challenging behaviours, so keep them included. Obviously, sometimes that is very difficult to do, and there needs to be care and, and, and protections around how that child can engage in certain circumstances when we're talking at the more serious end of offending but wherever we can to keep children included is a key factor in diminishing the likelihood that they will continue that pattern of behavior Duncan yeah Lindsay's story isn't unusual I was with two young women last week both of just 20 and both of the first memories and uh, experiences of caring for first memory in one instance was the police removing them from their family uh, and it's a really blunt instrument. Police are just there because it's the blunt tool we're currently using. But we actually then know what goes on within the care experience, people's involvement in the justice system. At a minimum, well, formally it's on record as 30% plus. So a third of the young people who are in Pullman would be care experienced, but that is done from a very crude statistic. I remember going to there when Derek McGill was governor and he reckoned it would be 80%. Uh, so you're looking at a huge proportion from a very small population because only 1.5% of our young population are care experienced. And yet they're really, you know, why are they ending up in those spaces? And then if you look at uh, the adult prison population, it could be as high as 50%. So we really have to look at this as not just, oh, that's just care experienced people. When you extrapolate that out into the severity of what we see as offending behaviour when we're incarcerating people, this is a population we really have to consider and potentially require special measures for. Wow, thank you. Um, moving on to Mary Fee, I don't really want to leave this particular line of question, well, but I think um, you're going to pick up on it, aren't you? Yes, I am. Um, th thank you, um, convener. I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's clear from the comments that have been made by the panel what your views are on raising the age t to 12. So I won't ask you to comment any, any further on, on that. But I'd be interested initially on your views of where moving the age of criminal responsibility to 12, where that sits with the GERFEC approach that, that, that we take. Is the movement to 12, is that at odds with, with GERFEC um, or, or is it working in, in cooperation with GERFEC? I'm, I'm kind of going to repeat myself in that um, I think it's a starting point. Getting it right for every child is about the things that we've been talking about. It's, it's about not making judgments about children. It's about keeping them at the centre and asking them for their views and, and what they think and respecting their rights. Um, so I think that, as I've said, this is a, a start, but it's not enough. Um, and if we are going to take a getting it right for every child approach, then we need to be thinking about how do we move forward if we get to 12 as, as the age of criminal responsibility, how do we then move to raise the age further? Now, just in interrupt you before I, I, I bring um, Claire in. I think it might be helpful to get on record. <coughs> the GERFEC approach, what is the, the maximum age that the GERFEC approach applies to? GERFEC uh, considers a child to be a child up until the age of 18, so it's in line with UNCRC definition of a child. OK. 
Okay, thank you. Cool. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to say. I, I mean, I think both UNCRC and GERFEC treats um, children uh, as children up to the age of 18. There is something that happens when children display harmful behaviours to others that means we struggle to keep hold of the fact that they are a child um, and under 18 they are still a child so still require a range of protections of different types because of their status of, of children and also there's exciting opportunities because they are still children to really deal with, with the behaviour and change and help them to change and, and address the behaviour and the issues underpinning it. Um, so I think we, we as a society if we're honest have struggled to do that particularly when we talk about children that are involved in the more serious level of offending to remember that their children up to the age of 18 and keep that in mind at all points of the system becomes more and more difficult for people um, and more and more difficult for different parts of the system but if we, we we are to really truly get it right for every child then I would suggest we really do need to do that and keep in mind that they are a child they may be causing significant harm to others there may need to be um, things various um, interventions put in place and supports to minimize the risk and um, that that child poses but they are still a child and we must always hold on to that okay thank you Duncan yeah I think again there's another really good example that Lindsay has from someone she knew in uh, from a care experience around really what happens if we see go for, for a child about getting it right for them up to the age of 18 what happens when we don't and the consequences for later on I had a friend when I was young um, I'd still consider him a friend uh, he he grew up in care all his life at the age of 13, he started displaying some harmful behaviour and running away. He was sent to a residential school. He ran from there too because he didn't feel safe. He ended up in secure care for running away, but nobody ever asked him why he was running away or why his behaviour was the way it was. Um, so he went from secure care back into residential care, back into secure care, back into residential care, all the way up until he was 16. He was let out of secure care a month before, no, a month after his 16th birthday. Um, and not even three months later, he was in Young Offenders. He's been in and out of Young Offenders for the last five years. He's now in an adult prison. He was out in licence and he told me, I'm going to do something silly, Lindsay. I need to go back to jail. And I was like, why? He's, I, I can't do it out here. I don't know how to live in the outside world. He was so institutionalised because nobody cared to understand why he was behaving in the way that he was. Um, it was more about the behaviour that he was displaying. So, and I don't think um, that raising it to 12 would be meeting Gurfik, um right now. I think um, it has to be that child-centred approach. If somebody had took the time to listen to my friends all these years ago, his life could be so different. He will face another 10, 20 years of coming in and out of prison. Is that fair? Thank you again. I mean, yeah. the, the texture that you provide with these stories is invaluable. And I think, again, uh, it's symptomatic of a lack of a trauma-informed response to, to these situations. Mary, yeah. sorry. Yeah, um, thank you. And can I thank you too, um, Lindsay, for your... Um, honesty and your bravery in, in, in sharing um, those stories. My, my next question was to be around um, the long-term impacts of people or young people that are involved um, in, in the criminal um, justice system at an early age and, and their, their level of offending and the, the level of disorder that quite often affects their whole lives. Um, and obviously, Lindsay, you have very clearly um, demonstrated that. I don't know, Duncan, if there's anything else you wanted to add, specifically in relation to, to care experience with young, young children. It does have the lifetime effect. I think that's a really sad story that Lindsay mm -hmm. told. Again, it's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. They get used to the system. That's how they know to perform in it. Um, and I remember when we did work with this uh, committee in the last parliament and the raising the care leaving age, and there's a particularly young man named Tony MacDonald who talked very candidly about the fact how he would he would get fevered up when he was leaving Parliament. You know, he went the whole way through the system, spent six and a half years in prison after it. But and he, he did he did manage to turn himself around. So there's real evidence that age twenty three and a half, he's you know, really sorted himself out and he's doing very well, so I'm proud to say to this Parliament. Uh, but he would talk about getting fevered up when he was the night before leaving. And he said then you would leave prison and you wouldn't know what to do. You had twenty, thirty quid or whatever it was to get you back home. 
I know you did, you went and bought your bottle of vodka, got on the train, and by the time you were back home, you are straight back to the cells. So, but in actual fact, that's where you wanted to belong. You knew how to work within the institution. So, but I mean, the, the thing that breaks it every time, with any hope we see with young people, and it's been said by other areas, it's a relationship. So we can use a very blunt instrument, which is the justice system, because that's what we need to do, because the behavior is being displayed. Why? Because normally within care, there isn't the relationship that's given them the lifetime love that they require to understand the world. They're lashing out because they don't have our language, our education, our communication abilities. I said, what is it? He said, I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to communicate. I have all of these feelings. Why is it? It's a relationship, solidity of a relationship around them that can give uh, that stable, loving uh, structure around them that will enable them not to get engaged within this. And whatever we do, whatever service or intervention or justice sort of punishment we're bringing in, you have to bring it back to the relationship. So the opportunity within this is looking at a culture shift. Policing can certainly play that role. If you look at it, and it's a, maybe a slightly crude example, the fire service did it. Stop putting out fires, let's start preventing them. There's a culture shift in the way that we could do this differently with policing. They have a key role. They're certainly not alone in this because we use them, it seems, as a system when we don't know what else to do. But that's actually symptomatic of a system that's not working, which is why there is a care review going on. But yes, we know disproportionately care experience people get stuck in the system. People don't bring them up, it's institutions. And the cost, you want to look at it financially, you're on average 100 grand a year to bring a child up in care, and then you're about 37 to 40,000 pounds a year when they're in the adult justice system. So we go beyond the moral issue, that's what life is. And I've met several young people who say, I thought my life was either going to be, I'll be doing a life sentence, or I wouldn't have a life at all. And I will say this, and it's not an exaggeration, we lose a care experienced person, normally under the age of 25, once a month on average in this country. They die. Uh, and that's a consequence, most of them probably involved with the justice system and, and, and for, let's say, lower level offences. But that's what's going on. The actual consequence of us getting this wrong is horrendous. And we do need to do a lot better at, at tracking these issues and the statistics and everything else in society. We are getting far more turned on to this, um, the issues and where they really are needing to be addressed. And we're doing this very much, as Alex was saying there, around the trauma-informed um, approach, understanding ACEs and the like. But we therefore have to bring in the services. We know the issue, but what are we going to do to fix it? One of them we know doesn't work is, is policing and its current guys. Um, sorry. Um just before I bring in um, Claire and um, Marion, culture change can take many years. Culture change doesn't happen um, overnight. D do you think, Duncan, that there is enough flexibility within the welfare-based approach that we have to make tweaks and changes to, to help make things better while we are going through the, the longer process of culture change? Well, I think culture change needs leadership. I think okay. if you look at this country, there's probably out there people would still back capital punishment if you did a, you know, uh, we had a referendum on that, but we don't back it as this parliament. I think this parliament needs to start, it, it can certainly show leadership. Bold. We need to be much bolder to show we're actually going to move this issue. And that's why looking at the issue seriously around ages 16 to 18 mm -hmm. creates the space that other solutions have to come in, other cultures mm -hmm. have to come in to populate it, to work differently. Unless that happens, you get a little bit of incremental shift. You won't get, we've got to do things differently here. So that's we need to create that space, which then means people, when we have the solutions out there, to then can start to come to the to start to come to pass. If you even look at policing around how they will look at very sensitive issues around how they will interview witnesses or victims of crime, we talked about places of safety earlier. There's a lot of ways in which we could address this differently, even just for the police involvement. But I don't think the solution is police. They're brought in as a blunt instrument at the end of us not getting this right. Okay, Marion. Um, if I could say that our experience of supporting young people who have been involved in offending behaviour is that one of the real difficulties is that their sense of belonging and their sense of inclusion is with um, their peer group who are often also involved in similar uh, harmful behaviour. Um, and one of the real challenges of supporting a young person to make changes in their life is about the requirement to support them to remove themselves from where they feel safe. So that's a really big issue. And if we come to that too late, the chances of success are much lower. So my view is, I would agree with Duncan, we need to be bold. We need to uh, uh, have leadership demonstrated to us. Um, and we need uh, the government to be brave about committing resources to the services and supports that we do have in Scotland, but are often not resourced well enough to be able to provide the levels of support that we know that we could. 
Um, so earlier intervention, whatever that means, and I don't just mean early years, early intervention when we know there's an issue that can be resolved. Uh, we have organisations and we have um, local authorities who have staff who are trained and skilled and experienced to be able to provide support if only they had the capacity to do that. Clear. Yeah, I completely agree. This is a, a culture change, and culture changes never end, do they? You know, it's it's an ongoing process of improvement um, at a practice level as well as a policy level, and that will always require attention. But there's moments like this to send a real clear message, um, as well as remove additional obstacles to children um, being able to address their behaviour that a criminal lens does. Um, so it, it's a really important marker, but it, it needs to be part of a much broader um, um, range of um, actions and activities at all levels, at all areas of practice, police is one, but also residential childcare. Um, and I'm really struck by this um, that the, the, um, Duncan um, and Lindsay have, have been talking about, the, the relationship between the care experienced um, journeys and some contact with the justice system. Um, and whilst it's really important to acknowledge most care experienced young people do not go on to offend, we really need to get that really clear. Of course they don't. Um, but for those children that are involved in offending, very often they will have some level of contact with the care system or have some trauma and adversity in their background. So both of those things are true at the same time. So we can't stigmatise or identify all children experiencing adversity and just find find them and do work with them. It's not as simple as that. But when we, th we see it on the other side in terms of children involved in offending, there is much more we can do to understand why um, and what that what that comes from. And it's really important to acknowledge also the, the, the issues that the system adds to that mix. This is not a child acting in isolation, um, despite what might be going on in their family and communities and, and how that's playing a part. The system also makes that, can make their offending worse. Um, and that's particularly the case in, for instance, residential childcare, when, where we still hear horror stories of children being criminalised for um, throwing um, something at a member of staff or trashing the room or taking some food. The police are then called at the situation then it exacerbates. So the system, by imposing that criminal lens, we did some really interesting research with, with um, staff in residential childcare about this because nobody sitting here in a, a, a committee room, nobody thinks that that's the right response. Nobody thinks that actually that they will phone the police in that circumstance. But when you're a lone worker, there's a situation escalating that you don't know what to do about and you're frightened about that, then absolutely without the right uh, support and training um, and and things around you, you may well phone the police and that can then have these knock-on effects. So it's really important that it's nuanced, it's not about blame, that we take people with us on that broader culture change. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary. I think before I bring in Fulton McGregor, just reflecting on that that idea that we need a culture change. Um, I worked with Duncan Dunlop very closely over the passage of the Children and Young People Bill that brought in the age of leaving care. And one of the issues that we tried to push back on was this reality that when, that this devastating reality that when a, a young care experienced person dies, as they do every month, that there is no formal mechanism for understanding that death or, or, or the circumstances around it or what might have prevented it. It's also symptomatic of the fact that we're not trying to understand the basis of trauma which leads to harmful, harmful behaviour. We need to get to that culture shift where we stop asking what's wrong with you and start asking what happened to you. Um, Fulton. Same. I, I mean, I think that everybody that's going to contribute to this debate would be amiss not to uh, thank you for the, the powerful stories. And as I said in the previous panel, as an ex-social worker myself, I feel, as well as an MSP now, I feel you know a, a compulsion to apologise for that a treatment that you received that day. And I think that it is, because the, the discussion's moved on since you uh, initially um, spoke and spoke about the societal change that needs to be, um, that, that needs to take place. And I think that uh, professionals working with young people need to realise that, you know, the consequences in terms of <coughs> criminal convictions that could take place, as you outlined very well. And I think that that's obviously why we're having this debate, firstly, to move it to 12, but even uh, possibly further, as has been mentioned by all panellists that we've had today. What I wanted to explore, though, was around the children's hearing system. We explored that a bit more in the last panel, and I realise it's not really come up to any great extent uh, in this panel. We've obviously got a, a, a unique and, and good system in place with the children's hearing system, but how do, you, how do the panel think it could be made better um, 
in terms of how we deal with young people that come forward with offences. Offence grounds, should I say. I think they shouldn't scrutinise the young person for their behaviours. I think they should try and tease out where these behaviours are coming from, because a young person isn't going to act out and um, display harmful behaviour for nothing. Um, there's, there's going to be background there, and if you don't understand that, then you can't help with that harmful behaviour. Um, so, yeah, I think that's... It came up in the last, last uh, panel. Um, we know that children accept offence grounds without having a clue what it means. They just go through processes. It's another process. Particularly when you're in the system, you go through you see a lot of professions, a lot of people with titles. Stuff happens to you and they accept it. And we know also they very rarely get legal representation. I think it's from 90% of the legal representation is for the parents uh, within the, the hearing system. That's not necessarily, not necessarily for the offence grounds. But we do know that the children don't understand it. And we also doubt sometimes that the panel members understand that they can get a criminal record that will be with them for life. Uh, for accepting offence grounds within the hearing system. So there's a real problem with voice and understanding what's going on. We've talked about a long time in terms of campaigning for greater representation of advocacy. It's less than 3% of young people will actually have advocacy within the children's hearing system, which is, I think, it really is unacceptable in this day and age. They're about to improve that to, to a limited degree, but it, uh, we have to look at it very differently in terms of if we're going to understand from the child's perspective and not just think they turn up to a room like this and not hearing isn't quite like this anymore. Uh, how are they actually meant to represent themselves and their voice? What's the best way? And they do it via a relationship. They will trust and they will say, this is what's actually going on for me. This is what matters. So regardless, this is why I was doing what I was doing. And this is the person or the things that will help me feel safe. Might be the school, might be somebody in the school more likely, might be uh, just having a relationship with a, a granny or a brother or a sister or something that has to happen. So it's really important that we start to understand this from that care experience perspective or the child's perspective. And you won't get that on the day of the hearing in that moment with a stranger, whatever title and intention they come to, to say, right, OK, what's the issues here? So we do have to look at it very differently in terms of what that will be. But it is it's quite worrying, I think, within the, the structure of the children's hearing system, how many people are therefore finding out that what they agreed to on their fence grounds is still there in the 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, and I know that, and it's not just that we'll come up in the PVGs whether you can do a job, it can be other issues that are disclosed later on if you ever come into uh, involved with the justice system. I think that if we could just, just stay on that, we think, I think the, the, the whole context around the children's hearing system as well um, comes into play there because many young people will be told that if they deny the grounds, then, it, then it, the matter goes to court, and that can sound even more frightening and intimidating so I think there's a whole you know the whole aspect around it as you say. I think yep. um, for me that it's around um, and I would agree with uh, Duncan that um, the hearing needs to find a way or, or panel members need to find a way of, of really hearing the voice of the child in that situation and I know that that's easy to say and much more complicated to achieve. Um, I think that the the move away from using offence grounds um, and you know having other grounds uh, to to um, call the hearing is more appropriate. Um, I agree that we need more advocacy and support for children and young people who are in the hearing system and, and going to a hearing. Um, and I have a real concern around some of the provisions in the bill around advocacy in relation to interviewing uh, a child uh, in that if we are finding it almost impossible to provide advocacy in the hearing system, what's going to be different in terms of providing the advocacy that's required by this bill? Um, so I think we need to look at that. And then um, what happens after the hearing? What supports are available to be put in place for that child um, beyond the hearing? Um, and I think that that's where we really need uh, longer term thinking around how we sustain supports and services and how we invest in those services in our communities and thinking about how we address the needs of children across Scotland. Um, something that works for a child in the central belt may not be available for a child who lives in the Highlands or, or in a, a remote area. So we need to think about that um, and I think that that's quite complex. Yeah, and just in, in addition to that, um, 
Children experiencing coming into contact with the children's hearing system as punishment. Um, so this will send a clear, you know, raising the age of criminal responsibility and taking those grounds off will help that. But there's a whole range of other things that, um, that, that are to be done to, to, to change that. And to some extent, it may always be experienced as punishment because they may not want to um, voluntarily um, do the things that the hearing is, is recommending. So that is the, um, the, the important balance um, and, and place in which which a hearing um, sometimes sits. I think there, as in addition to um, what Marion Duncan um, and Lindsay have been saying around the um, importance of listening to voice and relationship, I just want to throw a couple of other things in. Speech, language and communication needs are enormous in the population um, that we're talking about here. We don't have research in Scotland, but UK-wide research has indicated 70% of children that come into contact with the youth justice system have a speech, language or communication need. Um, um, I don't think we understand that properly. I, don't, I certainly know that we don't assess for that, um, and a lot of our services and practice doesn't account for the fact that children may not understand, they may answer in monosyllabic um, words, um, they may avoid eye contact um, because of the, those issues. All things in a justice context can make a child look very guilty. Um, so we've got to take account, as well as the, um, the age and stage, also speech, language and, and, and communication needs um, in, in that hearing context. Um, you, you mentioned in the earlier panel there was some discussion about 16 and 17 year olds, um, and they're not necessarily, unless they're on supervision, they're not necessarily um, under the remit of the hearing system. I think a clear message in terms of GERFEC and UNCRC is children should be supported through the children's hearing system. We can then look at what needs to be in place and what improvements can be made within that hear hearing system. Um, because I'm always struck, there are really um, important things to be done in, in, in improving what happens in the hearing system. But in terms of the court and children going through the court system, it's absolutely appalling in terms of the, the level of understanding and remember, um, even with changing the age of criminal responsibility um, to 12, 12 to 18 year olds will go through the, the court system potentially um, if their the level of offence um, re um, remits that. So we've got to really think about that, um, that aspect as well and really thinking about what we can do in the hearing system um, to account for, for th those issues as well. Yeah, and I think it's... Um, I thought we've got one more point, convener. Um, I think it's... Uh, uh, you know, there's really com quite compelling evidence that we've heard today um, in terms of raising the age even further, and I think that's been presented by uh, by both panels. And, and I'll, I'll just leave it for just now, as it'll be interesting to see how the committee continues to gather evidence over the next um, week, a uh, few weeks and months, and if that's continue, if that continues to be something that that, that progresses. Um, but I wonder if I wonder what the panel think um, if there's an opportunity just now with the system that we have, the children's hearing system, to do things differently. We heard the reporter in the last session say that they are beginning to put in place not not always bringing forward offence grounds, particularly for uh, children under 12, but also over. Um, and I wonder whether there would be um, some merit in reporters being given guidance, if you like, that all um, all um, offence grounds should be redirected, if possible, unless there's maybe a public interest in the, the nature of a specific offence. I wonder, I know we're probably running out of time, convener, but I wonder if the panel could, could briefly address that. I think that approach might take us some way towards raising the age of criminal responsibility beyond the age of 12, and I think that um, if we are to be creative, if we, if we are going to have 12 as, as the age of criminal responsibility, then we need to look at how do we um, support and promote the, the well-being of those children who come into the hearing system, and I think that that may be part of that. I mean, that is in effect raising the age of criminal responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I suppose what, what you've heard fr from us in, in part is um, around the statement that that can make, by making that clear um, to people in terms of some of those other cultural change and practice improvements, that that can be an additional lens by, by just stating that, that where, where you fit um, the criminal responsibility lens. Um, but in effect, it is the same thing. Yeah. Very bold statement about the sort of thing we're saying is required to really help move things. Um, so I very much welcome that. I think we've, we're almost out of time, but I would like to come back, particularly with Lindsay, 
and on the panel um, to the question of place of safety. Um, it, it's very granular detail to be looking at when we should be really looking at the wider issues of the bill. But I think your experience suggests that police stations can also be places of trauma rather than places of safety. And um, I'm, I'm not sure how much you've read the detail of the bill, but in terms of the way this is going, I mean, it's the only place named on the face of the bill. There are others, obviously, which are available. Um, but do you think that we should still have a police station as a last resort for, for no. somebody? No, a child should never enter a police station. Um, you traumatise a child by taking them into a police station and putting them in the cell. In the report that we submitted, um, we spoke about a project that is on planning um, in Western Bartonshire for a safe room for, um, for police to conduct interviews with young people. Um, the safe room will be in a council-run building where they will have access to the building at any point in time. Um, it, it's and amongst other services within that building. Um, so it's, it's quite a child-friendly building. I work there. Um, and the plan for the room is that it will be child-friendly. Um, it won't have these big interview rooms and um, it will be colourful. Uh, it will be soundproof so nobody can hear. Um, it needs to be a place where the child feels comfortable and they don't feel as if they have done something wrong. Even if they have displayed harmful behaviour, you're never going to get to the root of that in a police station or at school or several places have been said to me um, that our young people wouldn't feel comfortable going to. So I think um, it needs to be out with the justice system. Like the the police system. And, mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think I think that's absolutely right, and and I share that view in terms of um, interviews. But I, I think in terms of the spirit of the place of safety provisions within the act is is talking about not not for the sort of investigative interviews, but when a young person needs to be removed from a situation because the police officer deems that they're uh, harm to themselves or others. Um, what do we do in that situation? What's a place of safety where, if not the police station? Um, where, where would you like to see young people taken in that situation? Create a new space. We, we say that we are going to provide the best place um, for kids to grow up. If, if we don't make that the child-centred focus and think of, oh, where would you want to be taken if you were a child? You wouldn't want to go to a police station. That would just scare you even more. Um, some of our young folk have said, like, in the schools and whatever else, but I, I'm not sure. I'm going to pass it on to you. No, I, 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 there's a couple of things. One is, yeah, you can design it with children. How do they do it? I've been with people, you know, been right through secure care, right through the prison system. They actually said secure care was worse than the prison system because they actually had less freedom. There was such an enclosed space. The whole point is, well, how do we create spaces to keep children safe? That ought to be for very few children, very few, who are in the sense of significant harm to themselves. And we need to understand why they're at significant harm. So slight diverting it, but I do think there's something that Claire touched on earlier is I think we have to be seriously raising questions as the police are ever called to a residential house because the stigma that then comes with that in that community, oh, that's where the police are. Normally it's for issues around running away, but why are the police involved? And we ought to really put something back in residential care providers' sense of why, why are you using the police here? That it should not be allowed to use the police within that environment. Some of the offences are frankly ridiculous. And you can hear how within Lindsay's story, through an issue of being trauma, you end up being suddenly having an offence for assaulting a police officer. So I do think there's that, but the place of safety, I think we could quite easily design it. We've done it for other issues around interviewing um, victims of crime, and I think we could do that with young people and at the centre. And the one thing I'd say, Alex, is um, to all of the committee, there's many other young people who can uh, give evidence in different formats and forums if you want to come and meet them who can help you go into deeper into some of these issues if you require that we welcome yeah. that offer Lindsay can I ask and you don't have to answer this question um, but d do you have a criminal record for that night I don't have anything that has showed up on a PVG or a disclosure as of yet um, my last charge was four days after my 16th birthday so it is possible depending on jobs that I apply for that they could look deeper in and yeah, they would see certain things that um, was a very long time ago and uh, yeah that I know so many young um, people that I work with uh, that have done things when they were teenagers and they're now in their 40s, maybe their 50s, um, that smashing plates show up, um, offences that are 
normal child. So if I lived with my mum and I smashed the plate up, she wouldn't phone the police on me. Like, but our kids are criminalised for that. So. OK, thank you. Again, thank you for your honesty in that. Um, just one, we've probably got maybe two or three minutes. If, if there are any sort of final remarks or, or any final questions the panel, my colleagues have in respect to this. No? So just to, if there's anything you've not had the opportunity to say, I think now's the time to do it, but we will need to close in at, at about 20 past. But, um, for me, this is also about justice and the injustice of holding children solely responsible for children that are in extreme distress. And I think we shy away from discussions about justice because we think justice means punitive, um, and, and it doesn't. And these children don't get justice. Um, it's not appropriate to hold them solely responsible um, anyway, and they're experiencing a lot of distress, and it's the wrong lens, and that's not ju what justice looks like. I agree completely with that. I think that as a society, we need to take a, a good look at how we um, treat children and how we think of children. And um, holding children responsible at an early age for actions that are influenced by their experience of trauma, abuse, neglect, loss, is, is just frankly unfair. Um, and if we are a just society, we need to do something about that. Thank you. Duncan? Yeah, I would just reiterate, you know, we do have a good way of operating, I do believe, in terms of this parliament and the way that we reach out as a, towards our society, and that's why people are also giving uh, evidence here today. I'd say we will give you any evidence you require to be bold and be leaders, but the age of 12 is not bold. It is, it is frankly quite embarrassing, and we really do have an expectation that you can take this further and we'll give you any evidence you require. Uh, in order to support you to go much further with this and support you with that narrative as well. So please take that in mind. Thank you, Duncan. And Lindsay, you have the last word. I'd just like to share a little quote that is in this, um, our, in our response. Remember that there are wounds that some people might learn different from others, um, but also you, you have the power here to make a radical change and to impact in so many young people's lives. Um, and I think, as Duncan was saying, like, come and meet us and... Um, we will help you along that way. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, you have certainly helped us in our deliberations this morning, and, and, and I, I thank you for that. Um, th so obviously we've come up against our time lot, but uh, just to say, as I said at the first panel, if there are other things that um, materialise or you forgot to say, please do get in touch with the committee. This is a, an ongoing process, and, and um, I think we've all been very impressed by the depth of your knowledge, so we'll be tapping that again. Um, but thank you very much, and I suspend the committee to go into private session. <laughs>